We're honored to have as our commencement speaker today the Honorable Paul Sarbanes, former United States Senator from Maryland, the longest serving senator in Maryland's history. Paul Sarbanes served as senator for 30 years, a graduate of Princeton, clearly a good second choice to Stockton, and Oxford Universities and Harvard Law School. Senator Sarbanes sponsored the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, which reformed federal securities laws in the wake of the 2002 corporate accounting scandals. He served on a number of Senate committees and is a member of the Greek Orthodox Cathedral of the Annunciation in Baltimore. His son, John Sarbanes, won the general election for Maryland's third congressional district in 2006, the district that Paul Sarbanes represented prior to his election as senator. He has many ties to Stockton. We have five named professorships in Greek studies, and he is tied to those. It's also the case that his sister, Zoe Pappas, is the wife of our esteemed trustee, Dean Pappas. It is my great honor to welcome to the podium the Honorable Paul Sarbanes. Good morning. Good morning. I, let's try again. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. I'm delighted to be back on the Stockton College campus. Uh, I listened very carefully to Dr. Sot Camp, as I always do. And um, I just want to say that when I had to make the choice about going to college, there was no Stockton College. <laughs> So I was not confronted with that very difficult decision. <laughs> I want first to take just a moment to recognize uh, Bill Hughes, a good friend of mine. Uh, the president has already asked him to stand, but I, I simply want to say we served together in the Congress of the United States. Uh, he then served us as ambassador to Panama. And throughout, he brought a level of in integrity and thoughtfulness and just common decency to his responsibilities as your elected representative and then as the, non as the appointment of the president uh, to be our ambassador uh, to our public life. He graced the public life of this country. And I'm so pleased that he's here with us this morning. Thank you very much, Bill, for coming. Now, I've looked at the program very carefully, and I think I'm the last speaker uh, between you and receiving your degrees. <laughs> the organizers of these events are always, um, they're very smart about it. Uh, they don't give the degrees out before the speaker which is a great relief for the speaker because you have the concern that if they do it the other way around, people will get their degree and immediately depart from the hall. And by the time you get up to speak, there'll be no one left. So, But I recognize that means I have a captive audience and I'm going to try to be very considerate and hold my remarks down as a, unlike senators do who, you know, when they get the microphone, it said uh, they fail to realize that in order to be immortal, it's not necessary to be eternal. And I want to <laughs> try to observe that this morning. Uh, a college degree is a very major accomplishment. And I want everyone to stop and just think about that for the moment. It requires a commitment to meet high standards, to get things right, a willingness to consider with respect, ideas that differ from your own, a plain hard work and tenacity and moments of uh, genuine inspiration. As someone whose parents came to this country as immigrants from Greece and who was the first in our family to receive a college degree, I think I have some sense of how important this commencement is for those here, not only on a personal level, but also 
in terms of our society as well. Uh, you've not made this journey alone. Along the way, you have had the consistent support of your family, your friends, and your teachers. And I join them in congratulating you on what you have achieved. Uh, Richard Stockton, for whom this college is named, was a distinguished lawyer and justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court. Uh, Stockton served in the Continental Congress and was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He paid a heavy price for his courage. He was imprisoned for years by the British, lost everything he had, and died at a relatively young age, a pauper. So not all stories have a happy ending. Stockton's colleague in the Continental Congress and in the signing of the Declaration of Independence was Benjamin Franklin. And we just celebrated the tercentenary of his birth two years ago. Franklin was, of course, a giant in the arduous, arduous effort to create our republic. Uh, Franklin was a hero in his own time, and in my view, he is a model for ours. And I want to take a few moments uh, to talk about Franklin, but really as a as a model for the time in which we live. In many respects, Franklin speaks directly to our times and in ways that go beyond the maxims in his poor Richard's almanac. Uh, these are certainly memorable, not only for the best remembered ones like a stitch in time saves nine and a penny saved is a penny earned, but many others less well known that merit our consideration for instance, an empty bag cannot stand upright. It is easier to prevent bad habits than to break them. And he that falls in love with himself will have no rivals. <laughs> it is, however, Franklin's life and not his almanac that I ask you to consider today, because our time, like Franklin's, is deeply marked by conflict and uncertainty. In the contentious debate that surrounded the war for independence and the efforts to establish a framework for democratic governance, Franklin was the steadying influence, thoughtful, respectful of others' opinions, a voice for reasonableness and moderation, and when necessary, for compromise, what I would call principled compromise. That sounds like a contradiction, but we really need to understand that to make a democracy work, whose essential premise is that reasonable people can differ over what should be done, a certain amount of compromise is necessary. And it can be done in a way where you continue to adhere to your principles. Franklin set standards of civic responsibility and public service that were critical to the unprecedented experiment in democratic governance represented by our Constitution. Today, when the public discourse is regrettably too often dominated by the loudest, harshest, and most strident voices, the standards he set are more important than ever. Ben Franklin has long been looked upon as a great American success story. His personal success is but one part of the story because he considered personal advancement inseparable from civic engagement. As a prominent citizen of Philadelphia, he was responsible for the city's first lending library, its volunteer fire company, its hospital, and an academy that became a great university. Franklin always said that he would rather have people remember him as someone who lived usefully rather than as someone who died 
rich. He attached the highest priority ed to education, observing that genius without education is of little value, like silver in the mine. At the Second Continental Congress in 1776, he was one of the five members delegated to write the Declaration of Independence. With independence declared, the next step was to secure it. The prospects were dim. Representing his new nation, Benjamin Franklin went to Paris to secure critical French support, without which the American effort would almost certainly have failed. When the Revolutionary War was won, Franklin negotiated the treaty with England, affirming American independence. In all those complex negotiations, Franklin proved to be the consummate diplomat, achieving objectives that force alone could not have imposed. When you hear diplomacy derided, as old-fashioned and ineffective, I ask you to consider how skillful diplomacy has advanced our nation's interests over more than two centuries. We trace our diplomatic tradition back to Benjamin Franklin, who is honored today in the State Department as the father of American diplomacy. When the Constitutional Convention convened in May of 1787, Franklin was the oldest delegate, as he had been the oldest member of the Continental Congress. The outcome of that convention was anything but foreordained. On several occasions, it came close to dissolving in discord. Franklin warned that failure to agree would confirm the then widely held belief that popular governments cannot long support themselves. He was throughout the deliberations a voice for moderation and compromise, visionary with respect to the future of the new republic, but immensely practical with respect to the problems at hand. It fell to Franklin to give the convention's final speech, which was read for him because he was too weak to deliver it. He told the delegates that although he did not agree with all the provisions of the new Constitution, he would support it for the public good. He asked them not to cling rigidly to their own beliefs, but rather to join him in acting in a spirit of conciliation. No one was in possession of the whole truth, he said. And if the Constitution was not perfect, it was still as close to perfect as any document was likely to be. No one understood better than Franklin the delicate balance that our Constitution represented then and represents to this day. Our society is not a perpetual motion machine that once set in motion can be accounted upon to simply operate smoothly. Because ours is a democratic society, each of you will be called upon to lend a hand in keeping our nation on an even keel. Like the substantive problems it is called upon to address, the democratic process is not easy. While it guarantees to each of you the right to be heard, it does not guarantee that your views will prevail. It grants you the right to present your arguments while denying you the right to impose them upon others. It requires patience, hard work, and a willingness to have your views tested by the judgment of your peers. It presupposes a willingness to get involved in the problems of the day, to participate rather than simply criticize from the sidelines. 
If you ask me why this effort is worthwhile, I would give two reasons. First, as educated citizens, the graduates, graduates of this fine institution, which has attracted national rankings in recent years, as educated citizens, you have a special responsibility to attend to the proper functioning of our society. By virtue of your graduation from this outstanding college, you join a limited group in our society upon which special obligations and expectations are placed. And second, over the course of your lifetime, you will find it difficult, indeed impossible, to disassociate your own personal happiness from the well-being of the society in which you live. The ancient Greeks who first developed the concept of democracy had very pronounced views on the question of the individual's relationship to the community. They believed everyone should undertake some form of public obligation. And they looked down with scorn on anyone totally absorbed in private pursuits and indifferent to the public interest. They even had a particular word for such a person, an idiotis, the root of our English word idiot. I trust there are no idiots in this graduating class. The story is told that as the delegates to the Constitutional Convention left the State House in Philadelphia in September of 1787, their work at last completed, a crowd of citizens awaited them, eager for news of the deliberations. A woman in the crowd called out as the delegates filed out of the State House, what is it to be, Dr. Franklin? a monarchy or a republic? Franklin famously replied, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. A republic, madam, if you can keep it. Each succeeding generation of Americans has faced the challenge that Franklin uttered in the streets of Philadelphia more than 200 years ago. I know your family, the faculty, and your friends share my confidence that you will indeed keep the Republic. The good wishes of all of us go with you in that great endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sarbanes. Dr. Hoover, it is my distinct pleasure to recommend to you for the conferral of the honorary degree, Doctor of Laws, former United States Senator from the State of Maryland, the Honorable Paul Sarbanes. Dr. Satcamp. I accept your nomination of Senator Sarbanes for the degree of Doctor of Laws with this salutation. Under the authority of the Richard Stockton College of New Jersey Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, with all the rights, honors, and privileges thereunto appertaining. Congratulations. Thank you. It is wonderful now to have Senator Sarbanes, Dr. Sarbanes, as one of our graduates. Thank you. 